recording. Viper. We are now live. Viper. Come on. And on the internet. That's Jack. Jack. Yeah. Viper. Come on. <laughs> Come on. Come Welcome on. back to Astronomy 1020, everyone. Let's uh, let's watch the intro. Hello, space fans, and welcome to Professor Britton's Wacky Universe. everyone welcome back nice to see all your faces again on this tuesday morning or what's left of it hello there anakin hello um <clears throat> Riker. it's nice to see your little poochie again yep um so today i want to jump around in topics a bit um we have two chapters looming over our heads that i want to cover and I get kind of into these chapters, so I can kind of go a little nutty on the details. Chapter 16 is on the formation of stars and kind of a, a little bit on the interstellar medium, the gaps between the stars. <clears throat> Chapter 17 is on the nuclear fusion cycles of stars and how they evolve from main sequence stars to red giants and eventually explode. Uh, that's chapter 17. We need bits from both of these chapters to do our lab today. So although it may be hard for me to, to jump around a bit, because kind of once I get going on a topic, I tend to just hammer on it. Um, I want to see if I can jump around and do a little more of the stellar fusion stuff today and a little more of the interstellar medium stuff on Thursday. At least that's what I'm telling myself now. We'll see how this day goes. We also have one last little teeny bit from chapter 15 which we ought to clean up, which is the, the types of binary stars. <clears throat> That's directly related to the lab that you guys did last week. So uh, let's get right into it. I see no reason to, to waste time. I am going to go to speaker view and I'm gonna lock on myself. And we've got our note board up here. And um, uh, although I'm gonna want to show you guys an HR diagram, in fact, that's the other thing that I need to do here. I need to, I need to call up a couple of slideshows that are going to be very important for us to look at. So let me just do that now before I forget. Uh, we're going to have a little lesson on the different types of binary stars. And this is just a quick module, or at least I'm hoping it'll be a quick module. Uh, binary stars are incredibly important for the study of stellar astronomy. Shoot, I lost you guys. Where are you? Okay, here you are. Right here. Uh, very important because binary stars help us determine the masses of stars. And that was one of the activities that you did for me last time. So let me share my screen with you. And uh, let me go to uh, my little opening uh, salvo here on, on binary stars. Slide 94. Function F5. Okay. So here you can see a pair of binary stars in orbit around a common center of mass on their own Keplerian ellipses. These hypothetical binaries, oh, I'm sorry. Just shout at me if you got a comment or something. Uh, these hypothetical binaries, um, they have high eccentricities, meaning their orbits are, are quite elliptical. Um, in, in reality, things that form stable orbits they tend to circularize over time due to a lot of different reasons, including gravitational perturbations. This type of binary is certainly possible. And on some level, all binaries would be doing such a thing because the orbits are not perfect circles in general, but are more, more accurately ellipses. But this isn't exactly the picture that we're gonna develop with our binaries. For the most parts, we're gonna imagine, let's see if I have a picture here. We're gonna imagine something a little more like this. We're gonna, we're gonna imagine that we've forced our binary into a circular orbit. Oops, uh, 41. Jeez, it only takes me a second to forget what slide I'm in. 
here. Uh, pardon me. Uh, <clears throat> 104, that's the problem. Function f5, 104. Um, we'll imagine that we have two binaries, uh, sorry, two stars. And although the, the stars could be of equal masses, we're just gonna kind of pretend that one star is kind of stationary at the center of the frame and that the other star is kind of rotating around it in a circular orbit. Um, it turns out that even though this is not technically true, the formulas that you develop for this configuration are 100% identical to the formulas that describe this configuration. What? So it's conceptually easier for us to just consider the binaries as having one in the center of the frame and the other kind of rotating around it. Remember that our radius of orbit is going to be A. A stands for semi-major axis of the ellipse. You'll remember that from our lesson on Keplerian mechanics. And let's talk about a couple other factors that matter too. Um, binaries can kind of come in one of two varietals. You can have what's called a resolved binary pair. And that's where through a powerful telescope, you can actually separate the two uh, binary companions. Usually the angle between them will be very small, just a few arc seconds or less. But if you can resolve the two uh, binaries, you may stand a chance at actually real time watching one of the stars orbit around the other. Now, I put real time in quotes there because the typical orbit for a so-called visual binary could be up to 80 or 100 years or more. So it's a kind of slow, boring process. You might actually collect data for 10 years and only capture a small portion of its orbit and have to kind of project what you imagine the rest of the orbit is like. So the orbits of these stars are not one or two years. They can be many, many years, and it can take a lifetime of research or sometimes several careers worth of research just to gather enough data. In any case, visual binaries are quite rare. There are a few binary stars that are close to us. I'm thinking Alpha Centauri, obviously, it's the closest star to Earth, and Sirius also has a, uh, a white dwarf companion. But for the most part, our binaries tend to be more like the guy over here on the left. They tend to be unresolved. And that means you're essentially just looking at a single star on the sky, but you deduce that it's actually two stars through trickery. And part of this little module here is learning about the trickery. You guys already kind of had a, a little lesson in it last time, so this should be familiar. So we're gonna kind of cover uh, three types three types of binaries. Let's get out of our share mode here and let's take a couple of quick notes. Three types of binary star. Now, the first thing that I should mention before I get into either of the three types is that binary stars have a point. And the point of a binary star is to find the masses of the two stars. And uh, the way that we're going to do this is with that classic formula, which I've nicknamed NK3, Newton's version of Kepler's third law. In the original iteration that you folks learned way back in the day when we used to hang out in person, you learned the MKS version of the formula, which stated that the total mass of the system, the sum of the binary masses, was four times pi squared times the semi-major axis cubed over that gravitational constant divided by the period squared. And you guys will remember that the only two real variables in this equation are the semi-major axis measured in meters and the period measured in seconds. This formula was fine when you were first learning Newton's version of Kepler's third law, but for actual astronomy work, we have a slightly different version. Um, I refer to it as NK3, the Kitty edition, because it uses much cuter units. It uses the Keplerian units, and that makes it simpler to manage. In fact, you guys should like this version a lot more. 
the total mass of the system is just simply a cubed over p squared, where <clears throat> all masses are to be measured in solar mass units, which is kind of what we want anyways. All distances between binaries are to be measured in astronomical units, and all periods <laughs> are measured in years. Gesundheit, you guys used this Thank version you. during your binary star lab, but this is the first time I'm technically introducing it in the class. We'll be using this from now on pro probably every time we do a homework session. So put a box around this. This is kind of a big deal, okay? Okay, why am I telling you this for starters? Because you've got to remember the point. The point of a binary is this. Find and measure A, find and measure P, and then we get A. Oh, sorry, whoops, whoa, what am I talking about here? We get M, the mass of the binary. Or at least we get M total, and then we have to use tricks to figure out the individual masses. By doing this, we can come up with a science of stars, and we can learn, as you will see here in my share screen, if I go back to, well, hell, I don't rightly remember the number of the slide, but by doing these things, this is how we have learned to, to understand that the masses of stars are correlated to their position along the main sequence. Now, you all learned about the HR diagram in your last lectures. That was a few brain cells ago. You might have forgotten. The HR diagram, you'll remember, is essentially a plot of temperature versus luminosity. And while not all stars fall on the main sequence, in a real bona fide HR diagram, like this one from the Hipparchos satellite, you will see that eight out of every 10 stars, maybe even more, maybe even 90%, seem to fall along this diagonal line called the main sequence. And we can actually correlate mass to the main sequence. This is what we learned after studying all these binary stars. You'll notice, for instance, that a spectral type M star, which is a little dirt bag red star, one of these little common varieties that, that aren't too powerful, they tend to have masses that are anywhere from a tenth of the sun's mass up to a third or half the sun's mass. Whereas these extremely massive, very hot, bright blue stars, the spectral type O and Bs, they can have masses that go up to, hell, this isn't even good enough. You can find them all the way up to 100 times the mass of the sun. And we'll talk about mass ranges in a little bit. Okay. In any case, this is why it's so important for astronomers to study binary stars, so we can kind of figure out what spectral type correlates with what mass uh, on the HR diagram there. And that just helps us learn the physics of a star. So let's learn our three types of binaries because they're gonna come up from time to time. Uh, class, may I erase this? Are we sufficiently noted up? All right, who yep. will give you a thumbs up? Oh, I'm sorry? Yep, okay. I said, yeah. Cool. Okay, so the first example uh, is uh, what we would call a visual binary. A visual binary is a resolved pair. That means you can actually see the two stars go around each other. Normally, you'll have a setup or a configuration, something like this. Uh, here's a star, and here's a star and you're looking at them from some distance away on Earth, you've got yourself a long skinny triangle, something like this, okay? Okay, and they're subtending some angle, which I'll call alpha. You're looking at them from over here on planet Earth. The goal is to find A, the semi-major axis between them, and to observe the period. Now, as I mentioned earlier, the periods could be something like 50 to 100 years, anywhere in that vicinity. 
So you might actually only be able to get a small portion of their period during your, um, during your career as a stellar astronomer. And then you kind of <clears throat> estimate the ellipse from a small fraction of the orbit, and try to guess what the period is. The semi-major axis you can get from the small angle formula. You can solve for A as the angular size times the distance. And the distance you'll likely get from parallax because they'll be close to each other. So if we use um, distance is one over the parallax angle, I guess, holy smokes, the angular separation divided by the parallax angle if they're all in arc seconds, should give you the separation in, um, in astronomical units. Boy, that's a really convenient formula if you think about it. You can basically, well, there's, there's a, a third version of the small angle formula, and, and that's sort of what we're, we're using right here. This is a secret version of the small angle formula. It's just S is alpha times D if you use the following cheeky units. Uh, S has to be measured in astronomical units, A is in arc seconds, and the distance is in parsecs. This is actually another reason why astronomers went through the trouble of, in, of uh, inventing the parsec is because it makes this version of the small angle formula really, really fast, fast and easy to use. Normally, you want your separation here. In this case, guys, I'm using two different letters for the same quantity, so that's a little bit confusing. S, the separation between the binaries, is also A, their semi-major axis. In any case, these are all things that are easily measurable for a nearby star. I do have a cute little sample problem worked out for this. We could do it for Alpha Centauri, but I think because I've got all kinds of stuff to do today, I'm gonna skip that sample problem I think that's going to burn too many lectures. In any case, for a visual binary, you, you can kind of indirectly uh, measure your A, sorry, measure your A by parallax, essentially by parallax, and then you can uh, sort of kind of watch the period and thereby get the total masses of the two stars. Some classic examples. Alpha Centauri has a binary companion. Actually, Alpha Centauri is kind of a complicated system. Alpha Centauri has two main binaries, which is Alpha Centauri A and B, and they're orbiting around each other. They also have a third star associated with them. It's actually a trinary star system called Proxima Centauri. And Proxima Centauri actually orbits around A and B. So it's a trinary star system. Those things are only stable in very unique configurations. One of the configurations is two of the main stars are kind of in an orbit around each other. And the little dirtbag Proxima Centauri, which is a spectral class M star, it's kind of orbiting from such a greater distance that it treats these two objects as if they were a single point mass. Technically speaking, Proxima Centauri is a little bit closer to Earth than Alpha Centauri, only because it's currently in a portion of its orbit where it's, it's closer to Earth than it would be if it was on the other side. So technically speaking, Proxima Centauri is currently the closest star to Earth, but that's not always the case. Another famous example of a resolvable binary pair, let's see if I can get a picture of it here. Uh, I either, I don't know if I have it in my slideshow, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, but we can call it up here on the internet, Sirius star. Sirius is, is the brightest star in the sky as we've talked about before, but it has a, a white dwarf companion. This is actually a, an artist's cartoon showing you the relative luminosities of the two stars, what it would like if you, uh, you actually can resolve these objects. So I'll show you the, the real picture in just a moment. But remarkably, because Sirius is only about eight light years away, it has a tiny white dwarf companion that we can actually resolve. 
uh, I think the picture, I have it in some part of my slideshow, but let's go to the wiki page. They ought to have it there. Uh, at least they used to. Here it is. So this was taken with the Hubble Space Telescope. And you'll notice that the, the luminosity of Sirius, its brightness is just almost completely overwhelming the white dwarf. White dwarfs are quite dim. Oops. So you can just barely see its companion there. If you, you have to, you know, you have to really work to get this picture because it's easy for Sirius B to get lost in the glare of Sirius A. But you just watch this little guy orbit around Sirius A and that's an example of a visual binary. You can actually estimate their two masses. Obviously, these kinds of situations only happen rarely when the stars are quite close to Earth. Okay, um, let's check out the more common types of binaries, the one that we have to get through trickery. All right. So our second class is called an eclipsing binary. An eclipsing binary is one in which we observe an unresolved pair, meaning you're only looking at one single pinprick of light on the sky, and yet you know it's a binary. How do you know it's a binary? Because you take something that astronomers called a light curve. And a light curve is a plot of brightness versus time. And you guys saw this in your uh, labs that you did with me last class. Let's go ahead and make a little cartoon graph of what the light curve would look like. Okay, Jordan has left the kettle on, so I gotta go do some damage control here. Sorry about Wait. that. You'll remember that in the case of a star like the sun, the brightness of a star does not change very much. So if you were to go ahead and plot the brightness as a function of time of a normal star, you would expect its brightness to only change at the 1% level or not at all. In the case of an eclipsing binary, you go out and you just simply point your telescope at this star and you measure its brightness with time and you watch it do something like this. First, there's a large dip called the primary eclipse and that's where the brightness is cut by like half or so. And then there's something called the secondary eclipse. That's where the brightness is dimmed only a small amount. Now, let's see what you all remember. Uh, does anyone remember what causes this primary or secondary eclipse from your lab last week? Does anyone remember this? What causes your primary eclipse? No? I guess you all were just following the rules like good little soldiers, huh? Just doing whatever I told you to do? Is that how we work here? Uh, is that when it passes in front of the sun, like just passes in front of it the first time? Uh, yeah, wait, but, or, but not in front of it. Wait, which one is in front and which one is behind? That's what I'm seeing if I can get you to remember. The moon's in the front. The smaller one is in front. Well, let's not say moon. Let's say stars, right? Okay. The, but the smaller the, stars in front. Wait, where is it in front and where is it behind? The primary eclipse. Is it in front or is it behind? In front. That's when the smaller, hotter star goes behind the larger, cooler Riker star. Riker has it right. You're gonna lose more light when one star goes behind the other one. Let's think about why. In the secondary eclipse, the smaller star passes in front of the bigger star. 
So you're, you're still getting light from the little guy and you're still getting light from the big guy, but you've reduced your light by whatever percentage of the photosphere that the little guy is blocking. On the other hand, in the primary eclipse, that's when the little guy goes completely behind the big guy. And there you're losing the entire contribution of one of your stars. That means that you get a larger dip. The primary eclipse is the good one to analyze. As I walked you through last week, you can actually get a tremendous amount of information from your stars that way. You can get the relative luminosities of the stars. You can get the relative radii of the stars. And you can even, if you're lucky, uh, get the semi-major axis from your eclipsing binary curve. You can get the radius of orbit. So eclipsing binaries get you some of the stuff you need to understand stars, but it's kind of hard to get everything. You can, however, uh, if you're lucky, get a your semi-major axis, and you can get the you can obviously get the period right. To get the period, you just watch it go through a complete sequence. Like if this is the next primary eclipse, I would measure my period starting here when the primary eclipse starts, and I would measure the next time period there where the next primary eclipse starts. And by measuring the distance or the time between those two time intervals, that's my period. Come on, you stupid camera. Get back to business here. Okay, so eclipsing binaries. Now, if you want to remember the details of that, I'm sure you don't, but let's pretend you did for 50 seconds. You could go back to your lab and you could analyze what we did and that would help you understand those details, okay? Or you can go back and watch the video again that I made and put up on YouTube. Our third type of binary is called a spectroscopic binary. All right, in a spectroscopic binary, you take the spectrum, and it's the spectrum of an unresolved star. Students, what type of spectra do stars produce? What type of spectrum does the sun produce? Black body, right? Or no, no, that, that's what's in it. Um, Not exactly, Nathan. The, uh, I forget, I forget what it's called. Well, we need to remember these things. The absorption. Absorption line spectrum, right. So you get an absorption. As you always do when you take the spectrum of stars, let's take a look at that picture, uh, just in case several of you have forgotten here. When I take the spectra of stars, I tend to see something that looks like, where are we here? Something that looks like this. This uh, slide 48 shows you the uh, spectra of several different types of stars from a spectral type O star, which has faded absorption lines, to a spectral type A, which has really strong hydrogen lines, to a spectral type G, like our sun, which has many, many lines in it and beyond. In the case of, uh, in the case of an, a spectroscopic binary, you actually don't see one absorption spectrum, but you end up seeing two absorption spectra, and you watch the spectra shift back and forth over time. So to do this, I'd like you guys to kind of take a look at my little dot here. The little green dot represents Earth. You are the observer. And although you cannot resolve the two binaries, there are two binary stars, one which is the less massive star. That one's kind of got the bigger orbit. And the, the more massive star is a bit more sluggish. It doesn't get pulled around the center of mass quite as dramatically. Down below, you can see the rest wavelengths of hydrogen alpha and hydrogen beta or some other such elements. And rather than just seeing one set of absorption lines, we're actually seeing two absorption lines 
Here they're showing you the shift of the B line, which is the, 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 the wimpier star. And you'll notice that the lighter star has a more dramatic Doppler shift. And by measuring these Doppler shifts, you can get the velocities of the two stars. So first, let's do some good remembering about the Doppler shift. You'll remember that the purpose of a Doppler shift is to watch a change in the, re in the wavelength of your absorption line and use it to measure the velocities of the stars. For the Doppler shift, the velocity of the star is the speed of light times the shift in wavelength divided by the rest wavelength. This is how we measure the velocities of our individual stars. You measure the maximum shift, the maximum Doppler shift. You divide it by the laboratory rest wavelength that you know from your chemistry friends. You multiply by the speed of light in PAL. You get the, uh, you get the velocities of the stars. Now let's have a thought question for the class, one that I hope won't be too challenging. Class, how would I get the period of the, of the binary? How would you get the period of this binary star just watching those, those shifting absorption lines? I just want to see if you're worth it, if you're worth earning 100K a year as a research astronomer. You would measure the time between the eclipse, uh, the occurrence of the eclipse. Okay, who's talking to me there? Because I can't see everyone. Sorry, this is Mike. I didn't know. Oh, oh hi, Mike. Uh, yeah, Mike, where would you start the cycle? Where would you start measuring it? Um, at the primary eclipse. <clears throat> okay, remember, this is... Technically, you can sometimes get eclipsing... Oh, oh okay, I think I understand what you're saying. This is an, a spectroscopic binary, but do you mean kind of when the lines are matched up here? Yeah, yes. Okay. So right no, there, that's that. when you start. But remember, if you do that, you have to wait two cycles, right? Because they eclipse right, so you, both forward and backwards. You wait for uh, the smaller star that's rotating further out. You get it at the peak to the other peak. Yeah, that's probably how I would do it. If I were doing it, I'd wait till I got the smaller star at its greatest extent. And then I would wait for it to shift there and then all the way back again. I would wait for the maximum displacement of the wavelength because I think that in practice would be easier to measure. But in principle, Michael's idea wasn't so bad either. You just have to wait for two, two oscillations. <clears throat> in any case, you would build up some kind of a sine wave as you collected data, and then you could calculate the velocities of the stars. There's just one problem. Um, so far, you can directly observe the velocity and the period. But what am I missing here that I need to get the masses of the stars? I'm missing a quantity. <sighs> what quantity did I need to find the masses of the stars? Just look back in your notes like two seconds ago. You need two quantities to get the mass. Come on, someone play with me here. I'm uh, tired you need too. The, um, the distance between them and... The distance, right? The semi-major yeah. axis. Luckily, there is a way we can go from velocity to semi-major axis. Let's make the following argument. Here's one of my stars, M1, and it's being orbited by another star, M2. And we're going to imagine that the orbit is circular. In one period, the distance that the star two is going to travel will be the circumference of the circle. Those of you who love geometry will remember that if this is A, the radius of the orbit, the circumference of a circle is 2 pi a. If we use distance equals rate times time, the star m2 will travel a velocity p, um, a velocity v, and it will travel in one period a complete circle. And now if you look at these two sides of the equation, I can solve for the distance between the stars 
in terms of the velocity in the period. And I'd like to point out that you can observe the velocity through the Doppler shift and you can observe the period through the Doppler shift, but this is normally something you could not observe in an unresolved star because you're just looking at a single point source. So this is a cute little formula for circular orbits. So this is just uh, circular orbits for a binary star. Believe it or not, even if the orbits are not circular, even if the orbits are uh, ellipses, this formula comes out to be exactly the same when you do the more complex analysis. So this is kind of like the official formula for binary stars. Then once you have A and you have P, you can solve for the masses of the two stars. Okay, so this little module was perhaps not the most riveting of the different lessons that we've had, but it's important to realize that these are the kind of hardcore tricks that astronomers have to play in order to find and measure the masses of stars. We can't tiptoe out to Sirius and give it a dunk on our stop and shop scale. It doesn't work like that, right? We have to analyze the light and try to understand how the stars work. So once we apply these games, once we do these techniques and we start to collect the masses on a whole bunch of different types of binaries, we can sort of correlate them to our spectral type. And let's discover what we learned there. Uh, I'm gonna leave this behind. Can I erase everyone? Yeah, one sec actually one sec, sorry. If we hadn't lost a week worth of lecture, I would have done sample problems there. You know, the reality is if you guys were taking a final exam, there were going to be absolute crap loads of, of problems on binary stars. So normally I would go over this pretty damned carefully because it would matter to you. But in this case, you're kind of not gonna take the final because we all decided to dispense with that, right? So this is something that I can afford to go over kind of quickly. So whoever was talking, let me know when you're done so I can erase this. Yeah, uh, you're good, thank you. Okay, here I go. Uh, we will be having some binary star problems in our homeworks. Okay. What yeah, did you learn? Can... We learned that there is a range, oops. We learned that there is a range of masses that Shut up. we have. And this does matter for the rest of our lecture today. The range of stellar masses goes somewhere from a tenth of the mass of the sun all the way up to, let's just keep it simple, we've actually measured stars with masses slightly greater than 100 solar masses but these are very rare. So these types of stars, it turns out, um, these are common. And uh, these types of stars are more rare. You will notice my symbolic use of color there. That's, that's not random, the two colors that I chose. So let's have a discussion about that. Students, why, why can't I have an arbitrarily small st I mean, what the hell is a star anyways? Could someone a ball of plasma. A, a ball of plasma, but there's something else. It, why can't I make an arbitrarily small ball of plasma? Because wouldn't it um, like blow up because of the heat and like um, how it is? There are, look, here, I've got a... Remember this guy? Okay, I don't have a thing. Remember when I put... A tube in there oh, and yeah. make some plasma? Did that blow up? No. No? So I can make plasma and not blow it up. A, a star is more than just a ball of plasma. In fact, the lowest mass stars don't have as much plasma in them as you might think. A star... Come here, Jack. Cool. Here's our working definition of a star, okay? A star is a ball with fusion. It's not, it's not about plasma, uh, Raph, it's about fusion. Why can't I create an arbitrarily s small star or low mass star? Why would there be a lower limit to how massive a star can be? 
because it needs to be hot enough to cause fusion. Yeah. So this is this is the minimum minimum mass for fusion. For hydrogen fusion, anyways. What would it be like if you made a star that had or a quasi star that had less than a tenth of a solar mass? What would that thing look like? Would we would even be get... able to see it? Huh? Would we even be able to see it because it's so small? Yeah. Do you want to see what it... I have a picture of one? Do you want to see a picture of a star yeah, sure. that formed without enough mass for fusion? You ready yeah. for this? Wait for it. What is it like Boom. a brown dwarf? Oh, uh, there it is. <laughs> okay. Uh, Let me introduce you to uh, a ball of hydrogen and helium gas that did not meet the minimum re minimum requirements for fusion. Uh, would you be able to see it? You bet you would, because it would look like this. We call such objects brown dwarfs. I heard someone shout that out. A brown dwarf. Michael Peck. Oh yeah, Michael Peck. Thank you. Um, in fact, if we ask our weed smoking artist friends to draw us a hypothetical picture of a brown dwarf, <laughs> I have one here somewhere. <laughs> Juju. <laughs> <laughs> hey, there are worse jobs in the world to work. Okay, uh, so I know so, you could be an astronomy teacher. Make, I know exactly. <laughs> wow. That's oh wow. man hurts so bad, huh? If uh, if you if you type um, if you type brown That's dwarf, wrong, funny. <laughs> if you type brown dwarf <clears throat> into into Google, you'll find a an uh, you know an, an artist illustration of one, and you'll notice they kind of just crib sheeted that thing right from Jupiter, right? They imagine a ball of gas. Yeah. At first, when you first form a sucker like this, it would probably glow quite brightly. But over time, because it can't maintain self-sustaining fusion, it would eventually kind of cool down. And it would be like a big fat Jupiter just floating in the inky void of space, not yeah, having any friends Jupiter. around it. That would be kind of tough, right? That's so sad. Yeah, it is sad. But you know what? So the universe is full of a, uh, a billion sad tales. This is just another one of them. So uh, is Jupiter a brown dwarf or a planet? Yes. Both. Yes. <laughs> um, in a way, I think so. Jupiter is a thousandth the mass of the sun. I think it's a, it's, so Jupiter is a hundred times less massive than the minimum requirement for fusion. If a hundred times more matter had spilled onto Jupiter during our solar system's formation, we would live in a binary star system. And like Luke Skywalker, we could wake up every day and wistfully peer out at our two suns. So we don't Wait, get. So what makes a planet a planet? It goes around at a star. That's oh. kind of the stupid answer, right? I mean, yeah. the International Astronomical Union has a more sophisticated definition, but yeah, the office. Yeah, I was gonna say because a star can go around a star, so. Yeah, That's true. Yeah. It, it, if if you're not Pluto, you get to be a planet. <laughs> oh, like I'm, I'm sure that should be the new definition. Enough, like. As long as you're not Pluto, you could be a planet. But yeah. Pluto is just yeah. totally. Mean, if you read the rules, that's basically it. <laughs> or Pluto. Well, <laughs> you're right. They actually There's did like kind of write them. You know, you're not wrong. They did kind of write them in that, of that uh, ethos. Okay, let's analyze they, the other they, end of it. They partially wrote them in that ethos. All right, look. This was the easy one to describe. Now let's talk about this guy here. Why can't I make an arbitrarily big star? If all I need to be is, to be a star is a ball with fusion, why couldn't I just take a, a big ball with the mass of the Andromeda galaxy and just crush it down into one super big ass star that had the radius of a whole galaxy. It seems like physics should allow that, right? You have plenty of mass. Why, don't, why, would, why would there be an upper limit to what stars could, could grow to? Isn't that a black hole? Well. Too much mass, um, too much gravity. A, a black hole is not just about how much mass is there but it's about the radius in which you contract it to. And we're eventually gonna study the that's formula that's for black holes. So uh, if you had a star that had the mass of a galaxy, as long as its radius was big enough, like if it was the radius of a galaxy, it would not collapse into a black hole, not right away anyways. The real reason is a little bit subtle. 
And I'd like to show you a friend of mine that will help you understand why you cannot uh, build an arbitrarily big star. It's something called the Eddington luminosity. And uh, a cool example of this is the famous legendary star Ada Carina. Ada Carina is one of those rare, sorry, I, here we go. It's one of those rare cases where we've captured a star in the middle of just going through an absolute catastrophic meltdown. And this doesn't happen very often. So I want, to, I want you to take a picture at this thing. This is an example of, of an object, a star-like object, which has exceeded its Eddington luminosity. The problem with building stars uh, that are too massive is not that they won't be able to have fusion, it's that they'll create so much fusion that they will literally blow themselves apart due to radiation pressure. Now you gotta hear me out on this. Technically speaking, photons are electromagnetic and they should not have mass. Um, you'll remember that in order for an object to create a collision and to impart some uh, force to another object, it needs to have some momentum. And momentum is defined as an object's mass times its velocity. One would naively think that if you were a photon, if you were a particle of light, you would have no mass, and therefore you would have no momentum. But unfortunately, photons do have energy. Two and slices of ham, two slices of turkey, two slices of salami, and a slice of cheese in the middle through E equals MC squared. This means in a kooky kind of way, photons do have a certain pressure. Now, what would you like? <laughs> a little toy here. Uh, this would be really cool if we were in lecture together to show to you. I don't know if the demo is gonna work as well here, but I'm certainly gonna try. Hi, Bobby. <clears throat> You're not getting any food right now. <laughs> You this device. Food. Hey, who, who's the chatter? Who's the chatty Kathy back there? I, there's that a lot would of be noise my bro there. That would be my brother. Oh, okay. Can I just mute for a second, Riker? Thanks. I'm um, sorry. My dishwasher is also running, so there's a lot of chaos in my life right now. Um, <clears throat> this this little device here is a light mill or a Crookes radiometer, and what it is is it's a partial vacuum with these very delicate little weather vanes suspended on top of a needle. And Looks like a phone. Partial vacuum here. Let's do this. I don't want to break this thing because I've already broken a couple of them. <laughs> okay, what we're going to do is we're going to see, um, you can actually push these little weather vanes using photons. So let's see if I can get a light source here. It works really well with the projector, because the projector is a 400 watt light bulb. And honestly, I wish I had strapped the damn overhead projector to my van when I went and, and raided the office there. That's, that would have been a smart thing to do. Hardy har har. <laughs> yeah. Hold on a second. Let's see if I can do this. Okay, you know what? One of my big fears about these classes is that we don't have enough demos. So I am going to, a demo is about to happen or is about to be attempted here. So get ready for a demo, okay? Uh, I'm gonna share my iPhone. Screen sharing, Zoom, and camera. All right, I'm gonna to attempt to do a demo. I'm gonna twist the computer around so you can hear me. So the weather vane is pretty stationary here. Let's bring the lamp up to it and see what we can do. Whoa, can you see that? Yeah. Yep. Look at that. Whoa. Look at that. What? Right? Is that the force oh, right? from within? Look at that. Where's Anakin? It's supposed to be Anakin. like a, like a He's using the force. 
I'm using oh the my force. god. Right. I am. I'm using the force of radiation pressure. All right. Radiation. Anakin, pressure. he's using the force within him. <laughs> so Jesus. Now I can't believe that actually worked. I'm pretty happy about that. So what you just saw there was a visceral demonstration. Actually, there was a little bit of trickery there, but I'm not going to tell you about that. You're, you haven't earned that. Um, but you can look it up uh, if you want yourself and read about the Crookes radiometer or the light mill. In any case, the basic idea is that I used photons to push a little windmill in a partial vacuum. Now, that was with a 100-watt light bulb. Could you imagine what it would be like if instead of a 100-watt light bulb, you had a star which could pump out 10 to the 30 watts or something like this. As a, in fact, maybe we need to look a little bit more at the HR diagram to understand what I'm talking about. It's hard to appreciate just how many times more luminous a spectral type O star is than a spectral type M star. Function F581. You will notice that O stars can pump out a million times the luminosity of the sun. Whereas a spectral type M star might only pump out one thousandth of the luminosity of the sun. Class, <clears throat> how many M stars would I need to rival the luminosity of one O star? Let's annotate here. So here's the luminosity of my O star. Here's the luminosity of my M class star. How many of these guys do I need to rival the luminosity of one of those? Do I need to write this out on the board? Work with me here. The luminosity of an O-type star is a million solar luminosities. The luminosity of an N-type star is 10 to the minus 3 solar luminosities. What am I asking you to do? Jordan, can you turn the heat down a little bit? Thanks. Come on, what am I asking you to do? Is it uh, 10 to the 9 times? Yeah. Smaller? Very good. And what is, what is 10 to the 9? 1 billion. Meaning the implication is that you would need a billion spectral type M stars in order to rival the luminosity of one single O, right? This actually gives us a lot of insight into why galaxies look the way they do. I'm gonna kind of jump around all over the place here. Hopefully that'll keep your attention. Um, I wanna show you a picture of a galaxy like um, NGC 1300. It's a, it's a barred spiral galaxy, NGC 1300. A beautiful barred spiral galaxy. Come on, you stupid internet. Here's a picture from the old Wikipedia. Look at this beautiful galaxy. They're, spiral galaxies have a number of different components. They have spiral arms. This one has a bar-like structure. And in the center of the galaxy, you have something called uh, the bulge, or that's kind of like the central nucleus of the galaxy. Now, you should keep in mind that when you look at a galaxy, you do not actually see individual stars. Uh, galaxies are too far away for us to resolve individual stars. If you do see an individual star, like, uh, like this guy here, that star cannot be a part of the spiral galaxy. How do I know that's a star? It's a point source. Can you, well, thank you. That's very helpful, whoever did that. Um, you guys can see the little diffraction spikes on it there. Okay. Uh, whenever I see a star that uh, that is resolvable as a point source, I know that that star is actually, um, that's in the foreground, like there. <laughs> it's funny that you're drawing a, oh, thanks. Boy, someone's been smoking the ganja today. I think you've been hitting that medical marijuana. Now you're, you're feeling your creative powers go. Okay, get out of here. Now look. <laughs> it's not me, just All saying. Right. For once, it's Before not you. Fingers. 
It's okay. All right. It's all right. My eraser, my eraser can take these guys down before they can even show up. Now look. What color are the spiral arms in this galaxy? Bluish. White. Bluish. I would say they're more blue than anything else. And how about the color of the bulge? Yellow. Orangey. White. Kind of orangey red. Reddish. Yeah, kind of reddish. So what spectral types of stars must be dominating the spiral arms of this galaxy? Well. The, yeah, what's, uh, Morgan, what are the spectral types of blue stars? Oh, be a fine girl, kiss me, right? Yeah. So what are the spectral types that are, that are adding color to these arms? O types. Pardon? O. O. O and B and some A types. What spectral types are contributing here to the light that we see? Maybe you need to look at an HR diagram. I don't think you guys know your HR diagrams enough. What spectral types are contributing? GKM. Yeah, well, Ks and Ms anyways, right? Do you think, uh, share screen. Could there be any spectral type Ks or Ms buried in here? Possibly, yeah. Yeah, <laughs> unless there was a billion to one ratio, you would notice them, right? One O star can outshine a billion Ms. <laughs> So whenever there's O stars present in a galaxy or B stars, you can see them because they pump out so much damn light. These also, you'll notice that spectral type O stars and B stars live a lot less for many fewer years than a spectral type K or M. Slide three. Typically the lifetime for a spectral type O star might be 10 million years, whereas a spectral type M star might be a hundred billion years. That makes me think that the, the fact that we don't see any blue stars at all at the center of the galaxy, this must be a very old portion of the galaxy where all the O's and B stars have died off and exploded. Whereas in the spiral arms, this must be where all the star formation is taking place because these stars must have formed recently in a galactic time scale. 10 million years is recent uh, for, for a galaxy. The point I'm trying to make is, imagine the differences between a low and a high mass star. And I wanna, I wanna show you a cartoon no. picture, showing you what the differences in their insides might be like. Hold on guys, my computer's a little sluggish right now. I wanna show you a slide from your book that I think is just a simple cartoon that really drives home a good message here. 74. <clears throat> Imagine that there are three different main classes of stars. There are ultra high mass stars like spectral types O's and B's. There are kind of medium stars like our sun. Our sun's kind of a medium mass star. And then there are these little dirt bags, uh, the spectral type K's and M's, which are very red and very dim. Do you guys remember your layers of the sun here? What's this layer the here? The photosphere, there's the photosphere. What There's about the here? Coronasphere. No, no, the corona is out here. Oh. What's this layer? The, the, that's not the crest. That's the, the mantle's the center, right? No, mantle's for the Earth. This is a star. Oh. Convection oh. zone? Convection zone. Thank you, someone. How about this guy zone. here? What he said. What's this one? That's the meat. The meat? Yeah, that's the meat of the star. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Come on, someone, whoever said convection zone must know what this one is. The radiation zone. The radiation zone, and then the nuclear core. What nuclear do you see core. happening here in a very low mass star? A beautiful much, uh, sun much flower. larger convection zone. Why would there be a much larger convection zone? Does anyone remember why a star transitions from radiation zone to convection zone? This was a subtle yet an important point in my lecture last week. Why, or maybe two weeks ago. Why would a star suddenly switch over from radiation as its energy transport method to convection? No, this one might be too hard for you. 
it's about the fractional ionization of the gas. Here, it's all plasma. This is all plasma, so photons are just ping-ponging off of the electrons. But here, you have to kick, convection takes over because this is where you get some neutral gas and that starts absorbing photons and it makes the gas turbulent. So what does it mean if your low mass star is convective all the way down to its core? It's not that hot. Yeah, like this is not really all plasma. This is neutral gas. This star can barely get it up for nuclear fusion. It's barely capable of raising its central temperature just barely at the core to its whatever 10 to 15 million Kelvin needed. What's going on with your high mass star over here? It's super hot. It's so hot that it's all plasma in here, right? This is all plasma. Exactly. And that means yeah. it's all radiation zone. So why is it convective? What's going on here? Why would this star be convective at the core? Cricket, cricket. I think I read in one of my uh, graduate books that, that, that the rate of nuclear fusion is proportional to something like temperature to the power of 27. Small changes, what's that? small changes in temperature have berserk effects on your fusion rates. Oh. Why would the core of a high mass star be convective? It turns out these stars produce so many more gamma rays during fusion that what you saw happening here in this Crookes radiometer is basically happening at the center of the star. That is photon pressure pushing so hard on the plasma particles that the central core is becoming convective. And if you great created a more massive and a more massive star, this convection zone would get bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger until suddenly you started to look like my boy Ada Carina over here. This star is literally, occasionally the universe will try to form stupid massive stars, but they produce so much fusion so quickly that they eventually just blast themselves apart. Wait, did I share my screen? I'm, I'm confused where I am right now. This is Ada Carina. This star is literally blowing itself apart due to radiation pressure. This is why you cannot form a star with more than 100 times the mass of the sun. It will only live for a, a handful of years as it slowly just blast, or as it quickly blasts itself apart. Okay, so what's my point? My point is nature is violent and cool, and there is a limit to how small a star can be, and there's a limit to how massive a star can be. Dog crew, we can see your pooch there, Tim. <laughs> I'm with mine. I, Pardon? I, I have my dog here. If you want Where to see is it, it Raph? I don't it. see your dog. All right, hold on. I'm oh, I lost right. you. Weren't you driving your car or something? Yeah, no, I'm back. I'm back. All right. There it is. This is Show it. Show us your dog. Hold up. How do I change? Make this okay. class fun. See? That's oh, that's just dog. a little guy. Yeah, dead. He, he looks, like, dead he dog looks like he would be a... Oh, he's just a little tiny dog. Yeah. But very cute. You're not getting any of you. Okay. Um, <laughs> Back to class, anyways. <laughs> okay, so there is a limit to how small a star can be. There is a limit to how massive a star can be. Let's come up with a sort of little analogy here together. This is where we're going to move into the fusion portion of today's class. I'm going to skip star formation until Thursday, and I want you to just work with me here. Let's imagine that there's kind of three classes of star. And maybe we can even kind of put this into a, into a little graph together, okay? Or a little table, excuse me. So we're gonna have a column for high mass stars and a column for intermediate mass stars and low mass stars. So this is gonna be your mass um, range, okay? Okay, first we have our high mass stars. 
let's choose some symbolic colors here to help drive my point home. High mass stars um, range anywhere from eight times the mass of the sun all the way up to 100 times the mass of the sun. And they include spectral types O and spectral types B. These are the big, bright, insanely blue stars that you see when you look up at the sky. Then there are the intermediate mass stars. These range from sort of twice the mass of the sun all the way up to eight times the mass of the sun. And these are spectral types, I don't know, A's and F's. And then on the small end, there are your low mass stars. Okay. Can you guys see that? These yep. go from 10% of the sun's mass all the way up to two times the mass of the sun. And they include spectral types G, Ks, and Ms. You'll notice that I used green for the sun because the peak wavelength of the sun's emission is right around 500 nanometers, which is green in the visible spectrum. So the sun is kind of a yellowish green star, whereas K and M's tend to be quite red. Spectral types A's and F's tend to be bluish or even whitish. It turns out that the reason why we can classify stars into these three big clumps is because these stars undergo different types of fusion during the main portion of their life, known as the main sequence uh, time scale or the main, the main sequence lifetime. I'm actually going to expand this column just a touch because I might need a bit more room. The reason why some stars appear at different positions on an HR diagram has to do with their type of fusion. And the idea is that if a, if a star finds itself on the main sequence, if it obeys this very particular relationship between temperature and luminosity, this is the portion of its life where it's undergoing hydrogen to helium fusion. In the case of the sun, you guys are supposed to know the reaction that powers our star, our own sun, during its main sequence lifespan. During the 10 billion years where it can be a bona fide star, what nuclear reaction cycle does it go through to produce um, hydrogen fusion? You guys remember the name of that? That fusion cycle? Anyone? The proton proton chain. Thank you, Anakin. That's exactly right. And let's write that down. Anakin, do you remember the net reaction for the proton proton chain? The sort of summary Let's reaction? Um, Take four guess. protons. Yep, four hydrogens. Yeah. Into one helium nucleus. Yes. Two gamma rays. Oh, and beautiful. Look at that. There's yeah. someone that knows their nuclear physics. I'm getting excited just thinking about it, okay? Four hydrogens slammed together to make one helium and two gamma ray photons. Believe it or not, not all stars undergo nuclear fusion by the same process. Here, I might want to show you guys a couple of pictures from my slideshow. Hold on a second. Just a moment, I forgot to share my screen.
So ninety four and seventy three. Okay, function F five seventy three. This is the reaction that Anakin was talking about. We learned about this in a in a earlier portion of our class. There are three steps to the proton-proton chain, which I should not go into again. But the net reaction shown here in the pink box is that one, two, three, four protons slam together to form a helium nucleus. They form two gamma rays, that's the sunlight, and they also eject some little subnuclear particles that we won't get into right now. Not all stars undergo fusion like this. It turns out that as the mass of your star grows, so does your central temperature. And at some temperatures, nature prefers different methods of fusing hydrogen into helium. Let me introduce a sequence known as the CNO cycle. In the CNO cycle, we're also going to slam four hydrogens together to make one helium. But we're gonna make use of those 2% metals the little bit of heavy grit that pollutes the interiors of some stars. It turns out that, that nature can use the nucleus of a carbon atom, if it's present, as a kind of little workshop bench to build up a helium nucleus. And to kind of go through it quickly, because I'm running out of time in our lecture, first you're gonna have a carbon get struck with a proton to form an isotope known as nitrogen 13, and pump out a gamma ray. Then nitrogen undergoes a kind of spontaneous decay and one of the protons <clears throat> pops through the beta decay and it turns into a neutron. And then your carbon-13 nucleus gets struck with another proton to form nitrogen-14, also emitting a gamma ray. Nitrogen-14 gets slammed with another proton to create oxygen-15, emitting a gamma ray. Oxygen-15 undergoes a proton collapse and turns it into a neutron, forming nitrogen-15. And then nitrogen-15 gets hit with one more proton. At this point, I think it could turn into the next atom if it wanted to, which is fluorine or something, I think. But nature does, I'm sorry, no. That would be oxygen-16. What the hell am I talking about? If nitrogen-15 gets hit with one more proton, it could become a proper oxygen-16 nucleus. But instead, Nature instead chooses to kind of poop out a helium nucleus and use this atom as a workshop bench to build up its helium nucleus. Nature just loves alpha particles. They're very stable. And it returns carbon to its original form. The result is that carbon was a, what do they call it? A catalyst in the reaction? It was helping the reaction go, but it was not being consumed by the reaction. And the net result, if you forget about everything I just said, which I'm sure you will, is that the total reaction in the CNO cycle is four protons come together to form one helium and one, two, three gamma rays. That is not the same thing as the proton-proton chain. That is an increase in the efficiency of your nuclear engine. By what percentage did we increase the efficiency of our engine? What's the energy yield increase if you go from two gamma rays per reaction to three gamma rays per reaction? Well, someone's not awake today. It could be you guys. It could be me. I don't know. If I go from two I'm gamma awake. rays. Huh? I'm awake. I'm awake. I'm awake. So do you understand? I was imagining this would be a simple question, but you know. I tried to get my hopes up too high. If, if I went from two gamma rays per reaction to three gamma rays per reaction, that's more energy. What percentage increase is that? Wait, say that again. Oh, shit. Okay. No, 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 no. I'll get it if you say it again. I, there was like actually interruption with the connection of the internet. Oh, I'm sorry. How many times greater is three gamma rays than two gamma rays? That's what I'm asking you. Oh, that's 1% higher, right? 1%? Fuck no. What universe are you oh, living okay. in? Well, I mean, if it goes up by one, isn't that one? Like one out of three. three. One out of three. Does anyone oh, understand? Am I just talking percent. to the back? 33.3. 33. Uh, hold on, Tim. No. It's 33% 33. of three gamma rays. But one gamma ray is what percent of two gamma rays? 
50%. That's a 50% oh. increase, right? Because think about it, kids. Look, 3 divided by 2 is 1.5. That's 150% or a 50% increase from 100%, right? Do you see how that works? Yep. Okay. So your engine just increased, increased its efficacy by 50%. That, so three gamma rays doesn't sound like a lot, but imagine if, you're, imagine if your salary could go up by 50%. That'd be a good day, right? Imagine if you had 50% more cookies in your cupboard. You would be a happy person. I would like 50% more, but 50% of nothing is nothing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I guess a bad analogy, right? Hey, man, you're better off getting yeah, nothing if you're not going to get anything bad. You know what I mean? Well, I hear they're being pretty lenient with the unemployment these days, so you might want to apply for that. Well, I've got oh, unemployment, but I've been on unemployment since before this whole thing oh. happened, so. Well, I mean, aren't we I've supposed to working. get like an extra 600 bucks a piece? Oh, like a week? Choo choo! Yeah, you're supposed to get a stimulus check, so you guys should all definitely apply for that. Yeah, what if you're uh, working? If you're, if you're on unemployment, you should uh, be getting it anyway. If you're but... independent, you don't get it. No, no, no. I'm talking about like if you're um, part time or full time and on unemployment, I'm pretty sure that Gina Raimondo said that you're getting like $600 extra in each um, check you get. Well, that's good. I think that would be oh, helpful. Nice. Wait, so what happened to working and getting like extra money for risking your life to make a burger or something like that, you know? I think that's just yeah, part of the cold hearted nature of capitalism. You're just dog. <laughs> Oh, Anyways, okay. That's what I've Look, been doing. We can. T uh, thank you very much. I'm. I'm so glad that we have some creative people here in our class today. <laughs> All right. Let's so I'm. I'm almost gonna. I'm ready to end my lecture. Okay, because I know you guys are all kind of phasing out. And yes. <laughs> okay. <laughs> uh, yeah. But I do have. I do have a final point to make, or at least I was trying to make it today. Let's get the eraser and get rid of all this. Okay. Um, the final point oh. I was trying to make, okay. Maybe you guys could, all right, there we go. The final point that I'm trying to make is uh, high mass stars burn through their fusion much faster than, all right. All right, I don't, I'm gonna have to lay down the law here just so I can finish. The sooner you guys just let me finish my yapping, the sooner we can get onto our labs today. So. This was supposed to explain to you guys to come around to a big point. I have a question. Okay, sure. Is it faster? I thought you were saying it's more efficient. Uh, okay, maybe more efficient was probably the wrong word. Uh, uh, each, each cycle is more efficient at using up hydrogen, which makes it burn through its hydrogen faster. I think that's what I was trying to say. Oh, uh, okay. So I, I, I think we're, I, you were thinking of like a fuel efficient car but it's less yeah. fuel efficient. It uses fuel much faster. Okay, cut the shit, guys. I need these slides for a second here. All right, this, uh, I have a little button that I can push, which will deactivate your control. And I really don't wanna have to find that button, but I will if you guys, if you make me. Just let me get through this. Whoever the mad uh, renegade artist is, there we go, okay. This is trying to explain why high mass stars are producing so much fusion in their core that their cores become unstable and convective. It's also supposed to explain why, if I look at the HR diagram, a high mass star only lives for a very short period of time, 10 million years or so, and then it burns itself out. However, the final point that I needed to make so that you can understand what we're going to do in lab today, because what we're doing in lab today is a little bit technical. You would think that when the star runs out of its fusion, when it uses up all of its hydrogen, that gravity would kind of take over and make the star collapse. And it does so a little bit at first, but the net result is something completely unpredictable. Rather than the star kind of collapsing in on itself and forming some kind of a black hole, the star actually eventually goes through an expansion. So when it runs out of gas, it actually gets bigger and fatter and redder and cooler because the star 
does not maintain hydrostatic equilibrium anymore. The inner portion of the star contracts and falls in on top of itself, creating a thin, super hot shell of last minute hydrogen fusion. And this hydrogen fusing shell creates so many extra gamma rays that it overheats the outer envelopes of the star and it puffs it out and makes it grows into a big fat radius. This is the so-called red giant stage that most stars will go through, almost all stars. And that means their radii will eventually grow. And when they do so, they are going to, uh, hold on, I've got a picture of this. They are going to evolve off of the main sequence, like you can see in this picture. And they are going to increase their radius, decrease their temperature, and stars like the sun will evolve up something called the asymptotic red giant branch. The reason why I had to get to this point today is because today in our labs, I am going to show you a whole bunch of real star clusters and we're gonna to attempt to identify the age of the star cluster by seeing at what point on the main sequence these types of stars have left the main sequence and evolved up the red giant branch. In other words, if I can show you one more star, uh, sorry, one more slide here. If you were to actually show a real star cluster and plot a cluster of stars, er, hold on, where's this damn slideshow? This is what, okay, so there's, there's two types of star, let's just talk about something that's fun. There's two different types of star clusters you see when you look through your telescope. And anyone who has been through uh, down to my observatory to look at these star clusters may have seen some of them. There are star clusters called open clusters, and these are star clusters that have really big, bright blue stars in them, but there's only about 30 to 50 members. Pleiades is a kind of classic example of what's called an open cluster. These star clusters must be made of very, very young stars that formed in the last million years or so, 10 million years maybe, they're all spectral type O's and B's. They're very bright and blue and they burn through their fusion really fast. The other types of star clusters we see on the edge of the galaxy are the so-called globular clusters. And globular clusters aren't made of big bright blue stars. They're made of really old senile little K and M type stars that can live for hundreds of billions of years. This is kind of like a nursing home uh, for stars, okay? It's all these old stars that have been sitting around for billions and billions of years, and all the blue stars have kind of blown up and they've, they've, they've disappeared into red giants and then beyond. If you were to plot an HR diagram for a star cluster, instead of seeing stars all the way up the main sequence, you'd instead see something weird that looks like this elbow here you can see a bunch of stars which are still on the main sequence because they live for billions and billions of years. But here we see a whole bunch of stars that have since turned into red giants. And I know these stars are red giants because you'll remember that the radius of a star increases up along the diagonal axis, the right diagonal axis of your HR diagram. We can use this little elbow called the main sequence turnoff point to identify how old our star cluster is. And that's gonna be the job that you guys have for me today. But it's gonna require you to remember a whole bunch of astronomy that we've gone over so far. It's a little bit confusing. Let's see if you guys understand what I'm talking about already. How would I know that the age of this cluster is 10 billion years old? You'll notice that spectral type G stars are still on the main sequence but all the O's and the B's and the A's and the F's have since drifted off the main sequence and turned into red giants. What tells me that the age of this cluster is 10 billion years? Can anyone understand that logic there? Is it, does it have to do with the as in total shift that you were talking about or whatever it's called? Well, remember that an O-type star lives for 10 billion years. Uh, sorry, 10 million years. Uh, a B star lives for 100 million years. 
an A-type star might live for 1 billion years, and a G-type star lives for 10 billion years. So it's just something we ought to memorize. I guess so. It's not that I want you to memorize it, but if, if you don't know shit, then you can't really talk to you anymore. You know, like if you yeah. had to look up two times two equals four every time, you'd sort of be screwed at life because your mind would just be this empty box. So in order to understand things, yeah, you, you kind of do have to memorize it. You haven't had enough time to memorize it either. So none of this is entirely fair, but that's my mind already is an empty box. <laughs> right. Well, I'm going to fill it up with some star clusters in just a moment. All right. Now, anyways, if this star cluster was any younger than 10 billion years, I would still see some of the A-type stars sitting on the main sequence, which is like a dot, a dot. All right, hold on. Let me get this thing out here. Let me get my line tool. The main sequence looks like this, right? Mm -hmm. Or something like that. These stars are still on the main sequence. These stars are not. Oops. So if I had any A stars still on my main sequence, I would know that this cluster could be up to 1 billion years old. The fact that they've all turned into red giants means they've run out of their nuclear fuel. And this thing has to be older than 1 billion years. On the other hand, if it was any older than 10 billion years, I would expect the spectral type G stars to also have drifted off and form some type of uh, red giant branch. The fact that they are still on the main sequence means they're still burning their hydrogen and they've not run out of gas yet. So the last star that is on the main sequence is the age of your cluster. In any case, that's what we're gonna do in our labs today. It's not gonna be simple. This is gonna be a very difficult and confusing lab, but I will walk you guys through it. <laughs> okay. I think that's about as much attention span as I can ask out of you guys for the day here. Uh, our lecture is coming to an end. Let's take a little five minute pause. And do you guys know what materials you're going to need to do this lab? All right, no so let's three. explain that. I'll explain it again at the beginning uh, of the next recording, but you need to print out or you need to take from your books, section 15, ages and distances of stellar clusters. And this is one where you're kind of kind of need the whole damn thing. I provided it for you on Blackboard so you can print it out if you don't have it there uh, in front of you. Yeah. You're also going to need this piece of tracing paper, which may not have been included in your lab book, but I photocopied it and I scanned it for you uh, and put it up on Blackboard. Can you email that to me? Uh, I can why can't you just go on Blackboard and get it? Here, let me show you. I, I still don't have access. Oh, Tim, right. So, yes, Tim, I will email that to you. I'll email the whole bloody thing to you. In fact, uh, Tim, I want to yeah. send it from my Gmail because that's better. Can you remind me of what your email is again? It's L-A-P-R-A-D-E. L-A-P-R-A-D-E. Yep. 12B is in boy at Gmail. 12B? Yep. At Gmail? You got it. Wait, uh, Tim, can I just share my screen and have you look at this? Because yeah. uh, I ain't feeling so smart myself right now. So let me share screen. Uh, does that look does that look about right there? Yeah, that's right. Okay, so I'm gonna um I'm going to email you those materials because you can't get on Blackboard. Um, I'm just going to say lab and I'll, I'll attach them. Uh, okay, so hey guys, if I remember correctly, everybody kind of enjoys that little five minute break between lecture and lab. Is that correct? Yeah. Yes. All right. Yeah. So while I'm mailing this uh, theoretical main sequence, hold on. A, and so, so we need to print this out. I mean, or do you have a lab book? I do have a lab book, but I don't think that's in it, the tracer. So yeah, can you, print, can you print that out? Or can you try to read it? Uh, I can like try to redraw it. I don't have a printer where I am right now. Yeah, 
I'd say uh, just try to make a crude drawing of it because you can you can open up the digital version, right? Yeah. Open up the digital version and even like put a piece of paper up over your screen and then trace it out like that. That might work. Oh, having okay. a ruler would be helpful here as well, guys. Okay. You got that, Ellis? Uh, we're doing lab 10, yes. It's uh, lab number 10, but in the, in the lab book, it's exercise number 15. Okay, I am going All to right. stop the recording now.